Hey guys, how's it going? I hope you're having a really great start to your week. We're gonna do our recap video here in a second, but I wanted to show you some close-ups of some beautiful double tulips out in our garden because they're just looking so beautiful this morning. We had a little light rain. It's just a gorgeous day. So these are the first ones. These are the Labella Pock tulips, which I did show briefly in our garden tour video, but I think that they've opened up, like more of them have opened up since then. And I just think they're so gorgeous. I just wanted to give you some close-ups. Now, I do have to say the labella pox are not super reliable. So I planted 300 of them in this space a couple years ago. The next spring, they came up very weak. So I planted 100 more, then those came up weak, and then I planted 100 more this last fall. And I think that that's what we have here. Maybe a couple stragglers from the previous crops, but I'm thinking that this variety is kind of an annual for us. But it's so absolutely gorgeous, especially when you see it like mingled in with the snowflakes, which are right back there. We just planted those this last year and there's more of them over here. Anyway, these are so gorgeous. And these are more of a smoky pink as opposed to the Averons, which I'll show you here in a sec. So Averons right here. And I did show these in the garden tour and I could not remember the name, but these are definitely much more of a bright clear pink. But oh my word, aren't those the most gorgeous things ever? Look at these. Give you a close up overhead here. I do have some salmon pink poppies in this area too that are just starting to come up as well. And they looked so pretty. I love the fact that we've got the Vidal mix back here, which was a little earlier. It's starting to fizzle out now. And then this is our second really strong show, but I love that they're overlapping a bit. And the last double tulip I wanna show you are the brownies. So behind the gazebo here, and I've got two drifts. So we've got this drift here and then a drift right over here. But I wanted to get close in on one of these and show you how beautiful. And I wasn't expecting to love these as much as I do because they are a little bit more bright in the orange department. But I think with that kind of smoky purplish pink outer layer and you get a little bit of that tinged in the center, I just am enjoying them so much. And the second drift here kind of around the roses which I have treated with iron tone, they're a little bit on the yellow side right now, and the blue fescue. I just think that they're so pretty. This is one I'm hoping is very reliable because I would love to add more of this one in. So that's all, I just wanted to give you guys an update on those tulips because they're looking so pretty. So let's head inside and answer some questions. Okay, so we're up here in the sun porch. Let's just jump right into the questions from last week's videos. The first video was planting five varieties of potatoes. So in that video, I just showed you all the varieties that I was planting. I put them in our regular vegetable garden that's up closer to our house instead of our new space like I was planning on doing, but everything fit in really fine and I, I'm really happy with it. So I filled up three raised beds with those. Uh, Renee said, Laura, is there a video where you show how you store the food for winter? Yes, if you go onto YouTube and search Garden Answer, how I'm storing my produce, you can kind of check out our setup down in our basement. Also, while we're on that subject, we get a lot of emails every day, like, I don't know, 40-ish, 40-ish emails a day with just specific plant questions. And I wish we had time to answer, answer all of those in the early days we did, like when we were getting one email a week, we had plenty of time to answer all those questions and now there's just a lot going on. And a lot of those questions could be answered by going to either Google or YouTube and typing in garden answer and then whatever your plant question is. So garden answer, pruning hydrangeas, garden answer, aloe vera care, or whatever you know the question is. And I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir because those of you who are watching this recap video probably know how to find those answers in our videos. But anyway, I just thought I would throw that out there because it makes me feel horrible that I can't answer all of the emails every day. I wish I could, but it just isn't doable. Um, so next question is from Katie. Will the soil that falls on the gravel wash away or do you have to do something else to clean it up? So what I normally do, and I try to make as like small of a mess as possible, and that's why I didn't use my tiller. When I use my little mantis tiller, it does a great job of working the soil up, but it does kick soil out quite a ways. Um, so this way was a much smaller mess, but what I do is get my blower out and I blow like the, um, biggest amount of dirt away that I can and it just kind of disperses it evenly over the gravel to where you can't see it and then if there's anything left I'll just take my hose and kind of wash the gravel down or the soil rather down kind of underneath the gravel and there is landscape fabric underneath the gravel in our vegetable garden so I don't really worry too much about weeds or anything like that. Uh, Lori said I don't know why I hesitate to plant potatoes you make it look so easy how many potatoes can you expect from each one that you plant? So it, it depends on the variety, um, what the soil is like and how they've been treated. Like if the soil's fertile, are they getting consistent water? You know, all those things. But 
Typically you can plan on up to 10 potatoes per plant, which is pretty awesome when you plant like one little chunk of a potato and then you get these 10 nice potatoes from it. Um, so that's kind of a typical harvest. You might get a few, a little bit fewer, or maybe even a little bit more than that, depending on your situation. Kathy said no mulching, just wondering why not. And I'm not sure if you're referring to mulch, like if you're referring to mulching as hilling, uh, which hilling potatoes, I explained in the video, so you can watch the video for more explanation on that. But what hilling is, is you know, like when the plant's growing, you hill up more soil around the plant, gives it a little bit more elbow room. Sometimes it helps them to produce more tubers. I don't find hilling or mulching, I guess in this case, to be super necessary when you're gardening or planting your potatoes in raised beds because the soil is premium, it's lofty, it's been worked up thoroughly. It's not like I'm planting them in the ground that's got kind of subpar soil, which hilling in that case may be um, more beneficial or more necessary. Um, but I am going to mulch over the drip tubing. So I've left it out there long enough to see that the drip tubing is working really well to cover all the areas I needed to cover. Uh, and so now I'll come in with that raised bed mix uh, and cover right over the top of the drip tube so you don't see that. Uh, Gil said, I only have limited space, so I'm trying to keep my fruits and vegetables planting focused on things that taste substantially different when homegrown versus store-bought. Do you notice a big difference in potatoes? No. And in general, are there fruits and vegetables you would recommend prioritizing because they taste so much better when homegrown? You know, I think the benefit of growing, well, anything homegrown is that you can control what is done to it. So you can grow it organically, you can stay away from sprays, and you never really know when you're getting store-bought produce, how they've been handled, how they've been treated. Um, also, you are subject to whatever variety of potato or whatever they've grown. So at the grocery store, while you can buy a red Pontiac potato and um, it tastes the same as a red Pontiac that you'd grow in your own soil to me. I don't know. I'm not a potato connoisseur, so I don't know if there's a difference there, but I know that that potato I grew has been treated 100% organically and that makes me feel better about it. Now there are some things like tomatoes, like in corn, those are obviously the best things to grow on your, on your own. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, the best things to grow in your garden because the taste is so much better. And those two stick out in my mind as being like, grow those two at home for sure. Sarah said, can't wait to start my potatoes. After harvesting, how do you store your potatoes to make them last longer? Um, so first of all, I kind of do that curing process and we will post a video down or a link to a video down below on my potato harvest and what I do. Um, I let them dry for a little while. Like when I initially harvest them out of the ground, I knock as much soil as I can off of them, but I don't knock all of it off because I want to let them dry a little bit, let their skin harden. And then I'll take a soft brush or a soft rag and then just wipe off the rest of the soil. You can even leave some of the soil on there and that's totally fine. But the point is, is to not remove the skin because that opens up your potato to deteriorating faster. Um, but then I just make, make sure to put them in the coolest space I possibly can in a container that they're still getting airflow. Um, but again, we have the harvest potato link video link down below and then also how I'm storing my produce link down below. Check those out and there's a lot more information. Molly said, I know in the past you've used a rototiller on those beds and this time just a fork. Are you on your way to no-till? Not really. What are your thoughts on that, please? Um, I don't really have an opinion one way or the other. I know the no-till method is super um, popular here. I don't know. I just do what works best for our situation at the time. We have pretty good soil. We're working on getting really good soil, um, like working on it, adding good stuff in. In fact, I'm noticing so many more earthworms in our soil this year as opposed to other years. So I feel like we're doing something right. Um, we did, like in our new property, we did till up that big space for the flower garden and we will till the rest of it because it is so uneven and there's a lot of debris and stuff. And so it kind of helps us get everything leveled out and kind of like a um, starting point. And we may not do a bunch of tilling out there, but to get everything prepped for the first time, it's really nice to do that because it makes it way more workable, especially when it's not level. You gotta kind of move the earth somehow. Uh, M said, okay, now, it, okay, I know this may be an odd question, but are these just store-bought produce aisle potatoes? Are they actually like a dahlia tuber that you buy to plant? They are actual seed potatoes. Sometimes when you go to the grocery store, things are treated with a growth inhibitor, growth regulator, I don't know what you call it, but sometimes they're just treated so that they won't sprout. Um, and if they do, they won't grow really well. So just make sure you're getting a certified seed potato. You can find those at your local garden center most of the time. If they're grown organically though, I think if you buy them at the grocery store and they've been grown organically, I think you're good there. I don't know, let me get, know in the comment section what you guys know about that. 
Digs and Dirt said, thank you for the video. Uh, would you plant sweet potatoes the same way or do they have other mineral requirements? I uh, prep the soil the same exact way for my sweet potatoes, but they aren't grown by tuber, they're grown by slip or that's how I grow them. So they come as little tiny plants, little slips um, that you just plant in the ground and they vine everywhere. So like your regular potato, regular potatoes grow in like a bush form and sweet potatoes are like the sweet potato vines, ornamental ones we put in our containers. Those actually produce tubers, they're not that good, um, but there's the actual sweet potatoes and yams and things like that that vine out exactly the same way but produce nice, yummy potatoes. I grew those in the raised bed beds behind our greenhouse one year and they did really great. Laura, are you ever going to tie up your hair in a ponytail? Do not hold your breath. <laughs> Uh, next video was winter sowing and seed planting update. In that video, I opened up all the water jugs we planted up for winter sowing, and then I showed you our plant room and kind of the status of all of our seedlings and how they're all doing. Jody said, my question is, do you use biotone on your seedlings? I noticed when you were transplanting, you did not. I do not use biotone in for my seedlings. So what I'll do is when I prep my area out in the garden, when I'm ready to plant those seedlings out, I will mix biotone into the soil. Um, kind of as a nice fertile base for them to grow in. At this point, I just use liquid fertilizer. It's easier to get the doses, dosage exactly correct into all those little cells. It might be a little bit more difficult with biotone. Uh, Lisa said, do you upcycle or reuse your trays every year when starting seeds or do you use new? I reuse mine every year. So I just make sure to clean them up really good. In fact, I think I just restarted, was it eight? I have eight new trays of seedlings or seeds planted. I don't have seedlings yet, but some of my crops I've been bumping up in size uh, and they're out in the greenhouse. Like all of a sudden I had these empty trays and so I had extra seeds and I thought I'll just clean these up and I will start a new crop of stuff. So I've got new crops of paper daisies up there and stock and uh, ruby moon hyacinth, hyacinth beans and a couple other things. So anyway, I washed them in a kind of dish soap bleach solution and let them dry and they're ready to go for the next crop. Uh, 1992 Jason 2 said, when you start your seeds, do you cover them? Yes, so they are covered with humidity domes until the whole tray has emerged. And once I see green and all the cells, the dome comes off and it doesn't ever go back on. If you keep it on too long, it can be bad for your seedlings. They don't need that much humidity. Uh, Katie said, I can't stop looking at the background. Towards the end of the video, you can see something pink on the ground on the left side of the screen. It looks like a type of salvia. That is, it's a pink potion. Pink potion, hold on. I think it's pink potion. Hold on. Pink perfusion salvia is what that's called. Uh, we planted some of that in our landscape last year and I loved it so much that I have a little section I want to plant with that same plant because they're so pretty. Next question, I have a small perennial bed that is completely full of plants by June. You can't see any of the soil. Would it still be necessary to mulch or no? In those cases, it's not as necessary. The benefit of mulch is that it does help suppress weeds, but if your flower bed's filling up, oftentimes you don't have the weed problem as you would in a flower bed that's really open. Uh, but the other thing is if you're using a good mulch, it will break down and enrich the soil eventually. Um, so it's kind of a good soil conditioner that way. I mean, you could use like a really good compost as your mulch if you wanted to do that and it's even better, um, but not as necessary for you or for those flower beds that fill completely up because you feel like, well, if I can't even see the mulch, like, should I even do it? I still do um, because I like when I cut things back, you know, mid season, I like it to still look really fresh and nice around all the plants. Karen Larkin said, you definitely, uh, you've definitely inspired me to up my seed starting game. Where did you get your tidy tray? I actually got that at my parents' garden center and I cannot remember the brand. We will try to find something, either that one exactly, or something similar and put the link in the comment section below. Jesse asked, when do you start fertilizing your seedlings? So I start fertilizing them after they get their first set of true leaves. So the first leaves, two leaves that come out of any seedlings are not true leaves. You need to wait till that second set comes out that is actually the set, first set of true leaves. I'm getting all confused by my words here, so I hope I'm not confusing you guys. But anyway, I wait until those that first set emerges and then I use a half strength fertilizer to fertilize mine. And I'm using the Espoma Liquid Grow at half strength. And then once they put on a little bit of growth, I'm using full strength fertilizer on most of my seedlings at this point. Uh, Anya said, could you show us how to thin out your plants, please? I always struggle. Do you keep all the plants or do you chuck some away? Um, so it depends. If I have a tray of seedlings and let's say I've got 24 cells and 20 cells came up and I've got four empty cells. If I find some of the cells that have like more than one seedling in it that are spread out enough, I will dig one of those extra seedlings out and pop it in the empty cell. 
um, so that I have a full tray. But after I have a full tray, I thin them out and just toss them because I know that's hard for some of you guys to do. It's not hard for me because um, it's, it's just not. I think after a lot of years, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm desensitized, Erin. But um, I, don't have, I simply don't have enough room to keep every single seedling that comes up. Uh, if I had all the room in the world, I would separate all those seedlings and I would plant them out. Um, but oftentimes too, if you have seedlings that are coming out right next to each other like this, it's not healthy. Like you could damage the roots, roots on both of those seedlings if you try to separate them as opposed to just cutting one out and getting rid of it and letting one of them grow up to be really nice and a, a nice plant without damaging its roots and setting it back or killing it. Jaden said, do you wash or sterilize the plastic pots that you transplant your seedlings into? Uh, so I've been using all of the four inch black plastic pots that I potted all the true blue pansies around our house this spring. I saved all of those plant cans and I am out. Like I've used every single one. I did not clean those because I had, didn't have any issue with any bugs or disease or anything on those fresh plants. Typically it is best practices to clean everything that you're using for a new crop, but that doesn't always happen at my house. Which leads me to the next question. Kim's Montana Garden said, do you get a fungus gnat problem inside? Typically, no. Um, I had one small little, um, like I saw a few in our plant room this spring and I have never grown this many things inside or had this much water or humidity in a room ever in my whole life. Um, so I'm kind of learning how to manage that and like fans and opening windows. And so when I noticed a few fungus gnats, I got some of those uh, sticky trap things. We'll put an image up on the screen, but they're just like sticky pieces of yellow paper that are on stakes that you put around in the room and the fungus gnats are attracted to them and they get stuck on the papers and that way they're not able to reproduce and create a problem. So I got it right under control and I didn't have to do any spraying or anything like that, thankfully. But that's a problem, like if you have a crop of things in pots and then you plant those things out and then you plant something new in those pots, if that first crop had an issue, you could be potentially carrying on that issue if you don't clean those pots out. That was gonna be my point. Last question from that video was from Sarah. My seedlings have been doing great, but now all of a sudden some of my delphiniums are shriveling up and some of my other seedlings have light green leaves but dark veins. What is wrong? I fertilized with liquid grow and I'm using the self-watering tray. Some of them look like the tips of the leaves are burning, but they're inside. What do I do? So there might be a couple of things going on. First of all, whoo, if you're using the liquid grow, um, I'm not sure what ratio you're using it at, but I would make sure to use it at half strength. It's possible if your leaves are burning that that the fertilizer amount is too much for the plant to handle or your light might be too close to the tops of the seedlings. You wanna make sure it's a few inches above, like four to six inches above the leaves so that it doesn't burn them. So if you get water on the top of those leaves or like fertilizer solution, water on top of those leaves, it can cause some burning that way as well. And um, the ones that have light green leaves with dark veins, it's possible that um, they're getting too much water, especially if they're in self-watering trays, which I have, and they are a complete lifesaver in a lot of ways. Like on a daily basis, it cuts my workload down below half of what I would normally have to do, but you can't, you can't just put water in those trays and then just not look at them anymore. Um, a couple of times I've had to take the actual seedling part off of the self-watering reservoir and let it dry out. So I'll just pick it up and kind of put it uh, diagonal on the bottom of the tray so that it's actually sitting up out of the water because there's no way to cut off the amount of water that that soil is soaking up. And so it'll just continually soak up the water to where the soil can become waterlogged. So you just want to keep an, an eye on that. I'm not dealing with that as much uh, when once the seedlings are bigger because they're utilizing a lot more water, but those are just a few things that you can check. Next video was three ways to plant onions. So I just went over planting onions by seed versus sets versus uh, little plants or transplants. Uh, and then I did plant up some sets and plants in containers. So Angela said, I couldn't help but notice all those beautiful plants behind you. Do you plan to use them on your property or do you sell some? We do not sell any plants from our property. My parents have a garden center. That would be a tremendous conflict of interest, I think. Um, we have those plants for projects that we're gonna be doing here and at other places this year. Um, we typically get in one or two like good sized loads of plants that we work off throughout the year. And uh, in fact, a lot of plants that I have in the greenhouse are plants from last year that we just did not have time to get to. Um, so we winter them over in there and take as best care of 
of them as we can and then we use them the next year. Next question was from Twinkling Trees. How do you cure the onions? I've never heard of doing that before and those are on my list of attempting to grow. So we will link down below how I cure my onions. There's a video where I harvested and cured mine. Basically what it does is when you harvest your onions, the, the skin that's around your onion, that that papery skin is really thin and it's not a good enough skin to like prolong an onion storage. Um, so if you weren't to cure them and you were just to toss them into storage, they won't store as long. So when you cure them, you lay them out somewhere where they have good airflow and you let that skin dry and thicken up a little bit. And it also helps like kind of close off the top where the stem usually not usually, where the stem always comes out. It kind of closes and seals that area so that you know things can't get in and out of the onion. It's just, it kind of just creates a nice casing around your onion. And also when you harvest, your onions are very high in sugar. And when you cure them, the sugar compounds, I don't know the science behind it, but they're replaced by something else that helps the storage longer. Because the higher the sugar content, the less amount of time they will store. So anyway, it just helps with this to prolong your storage. Uh, Laura said, what does the land and sea smell like? <laughs> so I was using the Espoma land and sea compost and based on uh, probably a lot of your experience with the other Espoma products, they have a nice smell to them. And by nice, I mean it smells, it's the smell of success, right? So you smell this like, I mean, what is compost and fertilizer made out of? A lot of times it's got a manure com uh, component to it, so it's gonna have a smell. Um, so I am actually very used to the biotone, garden tone, all the tones. I'm used to that smell. In fact, you walk in our barn and it, if you're not used to it, it probably hits you right in the face, but I'm like, <laughs> like, I don't know. It just, I, I don't know, it smells fine to me. The land and sea, you would think it had a fishy smell to it because it has lobster and crab meal. It doesn't. It's like the most lovely feeling compost ever. And it doesn't like, maybe if you put your nose right up to it, you could maybe get a faint hint of C, the C component, but it doesn't, it doesn't smell. So no worries there. Andrea said, how far in advance should we start our seeds for onions? So it'll depend on the variety, but I think it's somewhere between six to eight weeks before you wanna plant them out. If you wanna grow them in packs like you can buy, um, if you're wanting to start them inside. Queen of Rain said, one set or start grows only one onion, right? Yes. Andre said, this is off topic, but I have a question about planting and planters as I see in your videos. I heard if you plant different flowers and plant types together, the same potted arrangement, they can kill each other off. Is this true? I've not had that happen ever. Uh, I mean, I, I guess I could say that maybe I've planted something with like a really vigorous plant with something that's not as vigorous. And so the vigorous one will kind of like swallow up the less vigorous one. And you learn over time, <clears throat> excuse me, you learn over time what plants uh, are compatible with each other and what will stand up to each other. Um, that's the only experience I guess along those lines that I've had is sometimes, you know, you might lose one if you don't keep the other one trimmed or off the other one's back um, that way. But I don't know of any plants that like have any kind of compound that they like give off except for like black walnuts juglone. yeah juglone black walnuts if you plant a black walnut tree in a container nobody's going to do that though <laughs> anyway uh, i've never had that be a problem though uh liberty said question related to raised beds and containers why replace flower container soil annually i know you do it in the spring but raised beds it's okay to use the same soil but add amendments not necessarily related to this video but i've been wondering um, you know, I think it just is sheer size. Raised beds, there's an enormous amount of soil. And if you were to take all of that out and replace it every year, I just don't think that that would be feasible. I also don't think it's feasible on in huge containers either. And it's almost not necessary. I do, on any container that makes sense, I replace all the soil. And a lot of our big containers don't have that big of soil reservoirs. So like our big estate planters at the very front of our property that right now have tulips and uh, big obelisks and obelisk obelisk what'd you obelisk. say obelisk obelisk, obelisk. Oh, that just sounds weird to me anyway they have a built up uh, soil reservoir so that like those containers look like they would hold so much soil but they actually don't um i don't know where i was going with that oh yeah because a lot of times when we're planting in containers we're planting annuals and stuff they will never need that much of a soil reservoir like their roots will never reach the bottom of those enormous containers. So a lot of times if you've got soil in those containers, unless you're having a disease or bug problem, you can leave the bottom layer of soil there um, and then just put fresh on top. And then in raised beds, we just add in good stuff, compost and amendments. And you could certainly give that a try with containers, but I tend to like to start fresh and not have to 
worry with like what the mix is like and if my plants are gonna like it. Uh, Cindy said, how deep should the container be? Would Dollar Tree window boxes work? Thank you. Yes, uh, onions are very shallow rooted. You just wanna make sure that you give them enough room to bulb out. And also like the bigger the container, obviously the more moisture retention you have and the cooler your soil is. So just keep that in mind. Isabel said, do you have a trick for getting soil out of gravel? Wondering how to fix a big mess when I ultimately drop a bag of potty mix on my gravel patio. Done that so many times. So I'll get a bucket. It's kind of like a painstaking pro process, but if I've got a huge mess, I'll grab a bucket and try to scoot as much of the soil as I can off the surface, just gently into the bucket so I can still use the soil. There'll always be some a little bit left on the gravel, and then that's the point where I'll use my blower, and then I'll hose the rest of it down. Um, that's just how I've dealt with messes like that. Okay, next video. Who is behind this? You, Russell. Hi, buddy. Next video was planting a pair of spalier and hops and a few other beautiful things. So in that video, I planted up the two raised beds that are behind our greenhouse, and I've really been enjoying them back there. I've been going back there every single day to look at the plants. Benjamin's already been able to harvest two strawberries from one of those plants, so it's been fun. Um, Eileen said, wouldn't you plant an espalier against a wall or a fence? Well, that's oftentimes how you see them, see them used, is to fill up a blank space, but I've also seen them used as living fences, uh, as interesting container specimens. The most interesting thing I've ever seen with an espalier is when we went and toured Christensen's Nursery in Washington, Mount Vernon, Washington, and they had apple tree um, apple trees trained into like little scalloped fence edging along a flower bed. And so there was like these, the trunk was huge. So I knew it was older and they must have started with like whips, like little tiny whips so that they could really train this tree. But it was a little scalloped fence edging that had big red apples hanging off of it. And it was the most magical looking thing. I would love to do that. I feel like Espalier is just a, an opportunity just to create. Um, and so you don't have to do a traditional like, this one had three levels. Um, I did a spalier against our old house in like a tree shape, but it was flat against the house. So it had that kind of like, really pretty tree shape. But anyway, um, I just, I feel like you have a lot of opportunity to just create. Ingrid said, um, do you ever get sore from all the work you do? No, I don't. It's so lame. Like I feel like my body is so used to the work that we do. I do get sore like the first couple of times I'm out in the spring, like for, <clears throat> excuse me, for heavier work. Um, I will get sore, but I feel like if I ever wanted to exercise and really work out, I would have to do some heavy stuff to get it done and to feel that soreness. Uh, Julie said, loving the flower and color choices, would you put the top mix over the drip tube? Will the drip tube get clogged? Um, also, will you be showing us how to take care and prune your espalier later? So our drip tubes don't get clogged. They have screens. So every emitter hole has a screen that keeps stuff out of the tube. Um, and then yes, we will probably be doing follow-ups on the espalier tree. Next question, Lo love what you've done in those two raised beds, thank you. Will you need uh, to spray the pear tree for bugs and such to get nice fruit like you have two with the apple trees? Yes, we will have to get those on a spray regimen and we'll probably be doing videos about that because I do have six other fruit trees that will be going into the new property eventually when we have water out there. Sandy said, this is a magical touch for that area. It was nice seeing the bees. So many others ask questions about the tree that I'll pass on that subject. The only thing I didn't see a question on is how, is will you have to transplant it when it gets a lot bigger? Uh, no, I don't plan on letting it get bigger. It may not stay in that bed, to be like 100% on, honest with that. Like when I very first put it in there, I was like, oh man, that's really tall. Once I got the, the plants underneath it, it kind of looks, it looks better. And that, that raised bed is so big that it can handle having a big centerpiece like that. And I wanted to create a fence or a wall or a semi screen right there. Um, I don't really like, I'm trying to rack my brain to think of any area at our house that would have the right light that would look good with that. The only reason I didn't put it up against a fence is that the spacing of those, of the branches doesn't match our fence. And I can't, I would only, put that up against our three rail fence if it matched the rails. <laughs> I know that seems picky, but I, I feel like it would look like too much if I had fence rails and then the tree branches and it, if they didn't match, it would be a mess anyway. Uh, but that's a huge raised bed and I don't anticipate having to move it. Hi, buddy. He like, look at him. Russell, hey, kitty kitty. Hi, buddy. You're so cute. Uh, Ken said the espalier pear tree is great. Something like that would be perfect for a small yard. 
Can any small fruit tree be trained to do that? I like to get a mango tree, but I need to keep it small. Now I can't say in regards to mango trees because I don't, I can't grow them here. Um, but any other fruit tree that I can get my hands on, we can train into an espalier. So I imagine you could with a mango. You guys will have to let me know in the comment section, those of you who can grow them. Uh, Jesse said, what do you mean when you say you overwinter? Did you dig them up and keep them in the greenhouse? So the things we overwinter in the greenhouse are plants that we have left over, like I said earlier, per perennials and shrubs that we didn't get to the year before, that they were allotted for specific projects, we just didn't have time to complete. Um, the other things that go in there are any perennial that we have in a container. So like for example, the containers along the fence line that Aaron and I planted up, there was hosta and heuchera and clematis and uh, creeping jenny, uh, red hot poker, all of those things we took out of the containers, repotted them and put them in the greenhouse because we don't like if it's a perennial, we don't want to waste that and we'll use them in other projects or plant them out in the landscape. Uh, Tam said, why don't you plant that pear tree in the ground? You have plenty of land. So I didn't plant it in the ground because I didn't want to. <laughs> I don't know. I wanted to try it in that container. And like I said, I can't really think of anywhere else I would want to put it yet. So we may move it out at some point. We may not. Uh, Bryce said, will this tree produce fruit this season? Yes. It's an older tree. You see the size of that trunk? Like it's a huge, huge trunk. Uh, Bethany said, will you make beer with the hops? Would be so interesting to watch the process. So I won't make beer with the hops just because I'm not a, I'm not a beer drinker. I am using those hops for arrangements. Um, so we used to have hops planted around our bunny hutch uh, when we were kids and my mom always used those for arrangements, but my dad and brother do brew. Um, so it's possible they would want to use some, I'm not sure. Uh, Mary said, did you leave the burlap on the root ball or did I miss you taking it off? So I cut out as much of the burlap as I possibly could. There is a little ring of it right below the root ball, but it's not treated, it's just raw burlap. So that stuff will um, rot and just kind of become part of the soil very quickly. But you do want to be careful if it's like the shiny type of burlap that's been treated or coated with something that wouldn't rot like raw stuff will and you'll want to remove all of that. Uh -huh. Lisa said, what are the benefits of an espalier fruit tree as opposed to others? Um, so the first most obvious, I think, benefit is that it's space saving. So if you have a small space and you still want to do fruit production, you can espalier a fruit tree and then you, you get a harvest and you don't have to have room for a, a big tree. Um, the other thing is that a lot of times you get a better harvest because when you're opening up your tree to all that light and air circulation, you'll have a healthier tree and a lot of times you get a better harvest. Um, and then the third thing is that visual interest. And I think that that's a totally valid point. I think when you have, especially when you have a small space and you want really unique things in your space, Espaliers are one of those things that, I mean, they're always interesting to look at. Um, people always want to stand and chat about how you're doing that. And I don't know, I think visual interest for me is a huge part of the equation. Uh, Kristen said, I love how each raised bed turned out. So beautiful. And now I'm super inspired to get started on my two by four raised beds from Gardner Supply. Um, where is the trellis from? So that is a Gothic arch trellis that I got down at my parents' garden center. We have a guy that it's a totally custom. I don't even know. I don't think he ships. What he does is he builds all of this beautiful iron stuff. He loads it up into a huge trailer in the back of his truck and then he just drives around <laughs> to different garden centers. So he comes around like twice a year, unloads all of his stuff on the ground and then we shop from that. So it's really a quite a special deal and I have two of those trellises and I love them. And the last question was from Donna. Love the Asian pear tree espalier. I want, I want one. Where can we order? Um, so I got that at my parents' garden center again. I am not sure. I'm sure there are sources you can order espaliers from that can ship to your house. Uh, I don't know what sources those would be. Unfortunately, I would check with your local garden center. That is your best bet. Um, oftentimes, if they're not bringing in espaliers already, they can probably order them. Um, like the size of the one I have now, unless you're getting like a big tree load, you know, because we already were getting a lot of trees in that load. The door is opening by itself. Yeah, come here. Yeah, come here. Okay. okay. Huh. Huh. Yeah. Okay, we're just going to move on to the next video, which was an April garden tour plus project update. So we just took you around. It was like an hour long video. Um, so the, for those of you who watched it, thank you.
<laughs> we showed you a ton of stuff, no, no buttons, baby, that were, um, that's going on out in the garden as well as where a lot of our projects are standing at the moment. So Jacqueline said, the house beyond the moon garden put up a fence. Why is there an alley between your fence and theirs? Who owns that strip? Also, it looks much better with their fence. Do you have access to irrigation water or just well water? So our neighbors did put up a fence. They've got three little kids and a fence is, was a good idea. I mean, I like the thought that we, I mean, our fence doesn't really contain anything or anybody, but it's nice, I'm sure, for them to know like their kids can go out there and play. You're gonna go do some running around. They can go out there and play and they're, they're kind of contained. Also, I can imagine what it's like to have a neighbor that has a video camera out all the time. And I try to be very, diligent about not showing a lot of what's going on around me because you know I mean I want to respect their privacy but anyway I think it looks awesome I love that the fence is there because it like created this solid backdrop for our arborvitas um, and it looks awesome so the strip that's between our fence and theirs they actually own it so each individual lot owns a section right behind them but there's an easement back there because there's a little access road that goes to their irrigation well so that whole subdivision that's going in right right there, um, their irrigation is off well, while their water is off city. It's like their interior water. Anyway, the next question was, Kendra, will you still be adding something on the arch into your formal garden? Yes, I had actually marked some things down at the garden center to put on the, that arch. I hope my mom is watching this right now. And they sold them right out from under me. So I'm gonna have to figure out something else. I was gonna put some grapes on those arbors, but now that we're thinking of roses, like climbing roses or doing a rose garden back there, we're thinking climbing roses. I don't know for sure. Um, we still haven't even spaced the rungs, like the, the horizontal bars. We haven't spaced those out since the day, like we installed those arbors and they're sitting there exactly how they were that day. Anyway, let's like, yeah. We don't wanna be in too much of a hurry around here. Uh, Shannon said, what size does the vegetable garden add up to be and what sizes are each of your beds? What type of gravel do you use for the vegetable garden and throughout your property? So I think that space, I had to be very careful about how big it was. I think it's only 21 feet deep from the lavender back to the arbs. And I only could have it that deep because of the driveway right there. And then I think it's 50-ish feet long or just under. Um, and then the beds are only three feet wide. I did not go with four footers because I wanted to be able to reach all the way across the bed to harvest or weed uh, with ease. And then I've got like the outermost beds are three by fours and then you come in one uh, level and it's three by sixes. And then I've got the L shaped beds which are six feet long L's and three feet wide. Oh, and then the type of gravel that we use in vegetable garden, they call it just a three quarter chip in the color blue. I also bought some three quarter chip in the color gray, which looks extremely similar. And I'm not sure if that's like a standard label or if it's just local label, I don't know. Tammy said, is the gate at uh, minute 128 new or have I just never noticed it? It's not new, it's been there since we moved in. Uh, Forest Ninja said, uh, hey, is your rhubarb blooming? Love your garden. Yes, my rhubarb's blooming. I need to cut those bloom stalks off. You're not supposed to let your rhubarb set seed like that. Um, it takes away an enormous amount of energy from your rhubarb plant, so I need to do that. And then I need to take those rhubarb. There's, I planted three of them in that pot. They're, one of them is struggling. Two of them look really good. I need to take them out and put them in the landscape. That's what I planned on doing last year anyway. I just didn't get around to it. Uh, Jennifer said, all the new projects are so exciting. You've mentioned in your videos that you'll be making changes to your current driveway and parking area. Are you planning on trying to park the vehicle somewhere more out of eyesight or maybe use some larger plants to create a screen? Um, so my hope is that one day we will have an area for cars to park because right now they do park as close to our kitchen entrance as we possibly can get them, which is the entrance we use. So it's very practical for us, but you know, it's not like the best thing to look at. So there is like, we have thought about different parking areas we can do out in the new property. We also are thinking of like, I'm looking out the sun porch and I can see the front of our house where our driveway goes by. There's an arbor up there. Um, I think we're going to get rid of all of it the driveway, the fences, a lot of the plants, we're gonna have like a plant party and have friends and family come over and dig up what they want um, in these front flower beds. And I think we're gonna do lawn, like we're gonna do a big sweeping area that is connected to our current lawn here so that it connects the two properties together. So our driveway will come in the entrance normally, it'll loop around back by our barn and where it comes out over here, instead of going back in front of our house, it'll go straight out into the new property and then maybe like halfway through the new property, it'll start curving back and meet our lane. So the loop will still be there, it'll just be much bigger. And then we'll have you know, a much bigger lawn space, a lot of flower beds in here and shade trees and things like that. That's kind of the current thought. 
that could change because as you know right now where that lawn's going to be i have my big plowed section for the cut flower garden so the more time that passes the more we kind of our ideas kind of morph a little bit uh, Amy said, question about Japanese maples. I've had one for three seasons now, and just this spring there was only one branch that produced leaves. All the other branches have nothing on them. What should I do or not do to help my poor tree? So I have the same thing going on with one of mine that I planted last spring. I noticed that all of its lower branches are leafed out and looking beautiful, and the top canopy, I see buds, but they're not budding out. So what I'm gonna do is just keep mine well watered. I'm gonna give it, I gave it some holly tone. Um, you could do holly tone, you could do some kind of root stimulator or something like that, um, just to maybe like give your plant like a kick um, and see what happens. I don't know, I, I'll show you guys mine in a vlog or a video at some point um, and kind of show you what's going on with it. It's kind of a bummer, uh, but that just happens sometimes. It's part of gardening. I might have to replace mine. Uh, Radical Accounting said, interesting how much smaller your estate seems from when you started. Why is that? I think it's familiarity, honestly. Like when we first moved in here, it felt like the most enormous undertaking ever. And now, uh, and even inside our house, like because we went from a very small townhouse to, uh, you know, a much larger house. And I just thought, oh my gosh, like it's going to take forever to get from point A to B inside the house. Um, and I even like thought I needed to have a coffee station set up in our bedroom upstairs because I felt like it was too much of a walk to go from our bedroom upstairs down into the kitchen, which it's so not. <laughs> now that we've lived here, it just feels like it's, it's pretty quick to get from point A to point B. I still have a coffee station in our room and I love it <laughs> um, so that I don't have to go downstairs first thing in the morning. But um, I, I don't know, I think the more time you spend in the space or the more time you're seeing a space, the smaller it, it starts to feel just because you're familiar with all of it. Uh, but now we do have things that help us out. Like we bought the Gator this spring uh, and that has been a lifesaver, especially with the new property. It helps us move around outside a lot quicker. Otherwise we'd be just walking everywhere and I'd probably be in a lot better shape, but it would take me a lot longer to get anything done. And the last question from this video is from Tom. You never talk about costs. What does some of this cost? This has to be an enormous amount of money. Um, so no, I never talk about cost, hardly ever. And I probably never will because the amount you spend on these things is so subjective depending on the area. When you're talking about plants, concrete, everything that we put out in our yard is crazy different depending on where you live, like what it costs. Like for example, from my parents' garden center, they carry a specific brand of rose um, that's beautiful. You go an hour down the road to Boise, Idaho, the same brand of rose potted in a smaller pot, they charge $25 more because they have the demographic and the area to handle it. We live in a very small rural community where we could not get that amount of money out of that specific rose. So what happens, like these wholesalers, they sell this rose to everybody at the same cost. The wholesale cost is the same. When it gets to the retail center, that's where the price is set. The retailer set it based on the demographic of the area. Um, so if I told you something cost, like a plant cost $5, and you go to your garden center and it costs $12, you know, it just, there's such a wild difference. Also, what we do in our videos, it, it is our business. And I just, I hope you guys all understand that. I hope that nobody ever watches our videos and feels like, oh, like I'm not doing well because I'm not doing all of the things that they're doing. Well, we never mean that, like our videos to be that. Our videos are there to help hopefully inspire you, number one. That's like my number one goal is to inspire you. Number two is maybe to provide a little bit of education. And number three is to maybe provide a real life look at some of these projects and what it takes and some of the successes and failures. And if you can take one of our ideas and adapt it to your situation, bigger or smaller, I think that that's a win for me. Um, so that's all that we hope from our videos. And we never expect anybody to 100% copy everything we're doing. Um, and I just feel so incredibly fortunate and lucky and thankful that we're able to do like our jobs line up with our passions. Like, I don't know how that happened for us, but I just feel super thankful for it. And the last video from this week was how to grow spinach for beginners. So I just went over a few different things in that video, like where to plant it and what kind of light exposure, how to plant the seeds versus uh, planting plants, and then the different types of spinach that there are. So Samantha said, is cheddar still around? Yes, cheddar's still around. In fact, yesterday I took a video of what the cats were doing. So we will put that on the screen for you. Yeah, where are your sunglasses? Let's find them, buddy. It's bright, it's bright inside. It is bright outside. Why don't you go look for them in the living room, bud? I think that's where I saw them last. And when you don't see the cats, this is where they are. There's Russell and Cheddar. 
looking extra comfortable. Did you find your glasses? Did you find them? Looking good, dude. Looking good. Stacy said, how do you control aphids on your food crops? So I try to do as much companion planting as I can. Like I add in nasturtiums and calendula. Those are super helpful in the garden to help control aphids. We also release ladybugs. I use um, if it's really bad. In fact, I just had some lettuce uh, early this spring that had like the signs of aphids and I sprinkled diatomaceous earth on, on the lettuce and around the, the ground. Um, hardly ever do it, does it get to a point where I have to spray, but there are some good like super insecticidal soap that you can use that is very benign to your food crop. I think you can harvest same day. I mean, definitely wash it after you harvest it, um, but uh, it takes care of the aphids. Debbie said, can you describe how to harvest it? A few leaves from each plant, can it keep growing if you cut the whole plant back? You could do either one. A lot of people will harvest just the older leaves that are around the outside of the plant, um, and then they let the center keep growing, or you can cut the whole plant off. You just wanna make sure not to cut it too low, like to where the point of growth is, like the crown of the plant where all the, the leaves are coming out. And that's typically what I do because I plant mine so thick that I just reach in there and cut off what I want, and then it regenerates. Uh, Janine said, wouldn't it be better if you posted this on March 21st? Well, in an ideal, perfect world, yes. It probably would have been ideal, but I know a lot of climates are still dealing with super cold springs and even snow. Um, so, you know, sometimes we get around to things maybe a little bit late, um, but you know what? The information will still be there next March 21st. Uh, Nicole said, thanks for the helpful information. You mentioned cleaning them. How do you do that? I just run them under water uh, and just make sure like on the Savoy type, I kind of separate the middle where it's really crinkled and make sure there's no dirt in there. But you know what? I don't usually spray anything in my garden. And if I haven't had to treat it with anything, I usually don't wash it. <laughs> Usually I like, I'll give it a once over with my eyes just to make sure there's nothing glaring. Um, but we just pop them in salads and we're just like good to go. One benefit of growing your own food. Question for you, I can't find the Biotone starter but I've got a Spoma Garden Tone. What's the big difference between the two? Use the Espoma Garden Tone if you can't find Biotone, it's perfectly fine. Biotone is just um, formulated a little bit more for starter. It's got lots of stuff that um, stimulates root systems and makes them establish really quickly, but if you can't find it, Garden Tone is an excellent substitution. Next question, hope you guys are well and safe. We are. I just noticed the chicken wire at the bottom part of your white fence. Was that a recent installation? Is that to help keep gophers or skunks away? I wish it would help keep gophers away and skunks, neither of which seem to want to leave our garden. Um, the I think those are hog panels that are on the fence. So they're a little bit of a wider grid. We didn't install those. Those were there. The previous owners put those in because there's such a huge tumbleweed problem in this area. And whenever a windstorm would come through before they started developing the area right behind me, it was all fields just full of weeds. And so those tumbleweeds would just barrel through the, the fields and then would come into this yard. And so when you have the fence, especially on that west side lined with the hog panels, it stops a lot of that junk from getting into the garden. Um, it also would help like if I did the entire perimeter with that it would help keep dogs out like neighbor dogs which is not a huge problem so that's why we haven't done it and last question for today's video is from Georgia I'm enjoying your beginner videos so much I've, I'm also planning to grow herbs in a galvanized container like the one you have in this video could you do a video on planting herbs in containers too we did one earlier this spring um, so we will link that down below and I'm sure that there are others from other years in fact I know there's a video out there where I planted in a bunch of galvanized containers. So I'll try to find that link and put it down there for you as well. And that's it for this week, you guys. We have a full week of really fun projects, hopefully a lot more that we'll be doing on the new property. I hope you guys are all doing really well and we will see you in the next one. Bye.